Um, PSAs for fatherhood this year. Um, when President Obama said that he, yes, he was willing um, to do that, we were really excited and it were recorded just before Father's Day this year. And you saw ESPN, who is now one of our partners, and it was because of, great. Do you remember Cheerleader Dad last year? It's because of Cheerleader Dad, it got so much positive response that ESPN, who doesn't do PSAs, said that we want to be a part of what you're doing. And they put together those public service announcements for us. And so that's new for us this year, too, with fatherhood. So we're excited about that. And as many of you know that the um, National Healthy Marriage Resource Center um, launched this year also a media campaign, a national uh, media campaign on marriage. And you'll see some of the signs around the twoofus.org. Anybody gone to that website? We finally got it unblocked from the federal government website. We said, we have to monitor this. You've got to let us watch it. Um, but you'll see some of the posters around, and they're part of that national ad campaign. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements before we begin with the program. The, for the uh, Charles Sutton's cluster group that will be going on that site visit, please meet him down in the Washington room area that you were supposed to report to um, this afternoon after your lunch and before you go on to your site visits. Also, um, if anyone has found a cell phone, a blackjack, um, it has a frontal keyboard. I don't know anything about this. I'm just re reading what I wrote down here. If you find one, uh, please let us know. Uh, Leah Rubio has lost um, her cell phone. And one final thing is that we developed um, a series of toolkits for practitioners for fatherhood. And the group that developed that wants to get some feedback from you about it. So if you can go down to the exhibition room sometime this afternoon and kind of give your thoughts on three pieces that they're putting together as a part of a toolkit for practitioners. Well, about three years ago, before I got involved in this, I heard a lot about Mary Myrick. And um, I said, well, what, what are the most important things I need to know? And they said two things. One, she has an adorable capuchin monkey named Winston. And the other thing is that she's one of the most passionate, dedicated, and knowledgeable people on healthy marriage and family strengthening, and she can act, absolutely get anything accomplished. Both those things happen to be true. And so it's my privilege just to introduce to you Mary Myrick, who will um, then introduce our luncheon speaker. Thank you. I have the great privilege of getting to introduce to you Rolanda Diaz Loving, which is better than Robin, who got to introduce me. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the context of this lunch plenary. Um, as most of you all know, because you're probably not at your first ACF conference, um, when this initiative began, ACF wanted to make sure that there was really strong cultural representation to this initiative, and it launched an African American Healthy Marriage Initiative and a Hispanic Healthy Marriage Initiative. And since then, they've added an Asian Healthy Marriage Initiative. And as part of that work, Frank Fluentes took the lead in that. He was actually going to be here to introduce Rolando and just got called to the White House. So I'm actually going to share with you a little bit about what he wanted to share about the context of Rolando's work with this particular initiative. So um, this initiative, the Hispanic Initiative, began in 2004. It began with a roundtable in Washington, D.C., where national leaders um, from all different walks of life in the Hispanic community came together to talk about how this marriage initiative might apply to Hispanic families. And out of that work, um, many things have occurred. Um, there have been TA events, there have been round tables, there have been conferences, research meetings, um, research papers, uh, research studies started um, to complement the broader work of the initiative. Um, as part of that work, we found, um, Rolando, I'll tell you a little secret about how we found him. Um, those of you who, are, who started with this initiative know that in the early stages, we were forming something that had never been before. Um, that was also true of the Hispanic Healthy Marriage Initiative, and we were charged with putting together a research team to guide the work 
that would be done. So late one night, I was using my very favorite research tool, Google, and um, I found this guy in Mexico City. And he had written all these papers in Spanish, but they had the word marriage in them. I was sure they were good. And so I wrote to him very late at night and said, you know, we do this really important work. We'd like you to participate in that work with us. And by the way, are you as nice as you look on your web page? And he wrote me back and said, I think I am. And how can I help you? So that began actually a relationship that over the last several years has added a very meaningful dimension to the work of the Healthy Marriage Initiative. Um, over these last several years, he's been to the United States many different times. Um, and by the way, it's as easy to get here as it is Oklahoma. So um, he's glad to be here instead of Oklahoma. He's actually done a tour of duty as a scholar in residence for the Health Hispanic Healthy Marriage Initiative, living in Oklahoma City, traveling to sites, many of your sites around the country, uh, meeting with you about the populations you serve. One of the things that he's been charged to do in the last year and a half or so is working with the Andy Casey Foundation and ACF is to really be responsive to a need that many of you said you had, which was to have some tools to make the mainstream curriculums that are available for marriage education more culturally relevant to the populations you were working with. And so over the last several years, he and Leah Moses Rubio, who you saw yesterday, and others have been working with practitioners across the country with curriculum developers. And we've developed three modules that are available on healthymarriageinfo.org. I would tell you quickly to the fatherhood folks, I think these curriculum modules would be equally valuable to you because they talk mostly about cultural context. So if you're working with Latinos, whether you are Latino or not, if you were just working with Latinos, these curriculum modules would be nice supplement to any curriculum you're using to add some cultural nuances to the work that you do. So let me tell you about Rolando, a couple of little things I want to uh, mention. Um, there's a full bio about him in the program. He is um, a professor of psychology and the head of the psychological research unit at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. I usually just say the largest university in the world. They have 305 student, 305,000 students in Mexico City alone. <clears throat> so he's in a big place. About all of us could be the university. Uh, he has spoken on every continent but one. He's in about 12 countries a year. He's been the head of every national and international Hispanic family organization. So he knows a lot about this field and he knows a lot of people who are working in this field, which has really helped us inform the work that we put together. If you want to read anything he's written, you probably would need to know Spanish to read part of it, but he has a 220 page vitae. So don't just hit send when you see that pop up on your, um, or print when you see that show up on your email. Um, your program says that he spent some time in New Mexico. He did not. He spent time in Mexico, Mexico. Uh, but he has spent time in Oklahoma and got his doctorate degree from the University of Texas. So he is a Texas and Oki um, of sorts. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to somebody who is the nightest, smartest, most insightful researcher that I've ever known and that you're likely to ever meet, Rolando Diaz-Loving. One of the problems about introductions is that um, after things have been said, you might not live up to them. But we'll try to make the best. I should tell you that the process of uh, acculturation and migration uh, gets to you before you notice. Um, in the program, it says that I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I didn't know that the National University of Mexico actually moved up there. <laughs> um, next time, I might be in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about um, culture and how culture affects uh, different aspects of individual growth and family and relationships in general. So if I could have uh, the slides on, very good. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the prospects for families uh, and the role of culture in this process. Now, one of the things that uh, we might want to know is what this American poet said uh, several centuries ago is that there's two statements about human beings that are true. 
that all human beings are alike and that they're all different. And in these two statements and facts is human wisdom. So one of the things that we would like to say is that there's many things that make us similar, but there's also some things that make us different. And this is true not only about life, but also about science and especially about psychology. Uh, in psychology, uh, the basic orientation has been what we call a universal perspective. That is, once we do research with a certain group, this information can be passed on to other groups. And the most advanced part of the universal perspective is the study of the human genome. And what we know about these studies is that human beings share 99.9% .9 of their chromosome makeup. This tells us that we're basically all the same. We have two eyes, we have one nose, one mouth, two legs. So what we find for somebody must apply for everybody else. So how would we make a diagnosis of what people are like, what type of interventions and programs we make, and what type of evaluations we make of the impacts of these programs should be the same everywhere. What are some of the universals? Well, one universal is that we do need families. Why? From the evolutionary perspective, because it's necessary for reproduction and survival. But if we put some culture into it, we'll find something that says in the Mexican culture that with you, any piece of field looks like a ranch and any simple chocolate becomes rich chocolate. So it seems like it's an important thing. In terms of another universal, there's a series of studies done with different cultural groups that shows that when you do have a stable and positive marital relationship, and the key words are stable and positive, then what you find is that people have better mental health, they're more happy and satisfied with life in general, they have better physical health, they live longer lives with less pain, they have better economic outcomes, they're happier and more productive at work, and they give better and safer environments to their children. So this is a universal. Independent of the group that you're working with, if you have a stable and positive marital relationship, you have all of these positive outcomes. Now, how far, far do these universals go? Are there any cultural differences in any areas? Well, the mainstream of scientific research has taken on the universal side. And what you find is that the mainstream is very interested in something that's called internal validity. That is, when I do a study, I want to make sure that whatever I find is true. Now, once I find that something is true, who can I say this is true about? Well, the mainstream doesn't really bother much with external validity. Is this true of one group or of all groups? The mainstream says, if this is true of one group, it's true of everybody. And if you're in physics, you would say that probably that's true. What would happen if I let go of this piece of paper? It falls, and that's the law of gravity. It's a universal. Does this always happen? No. If I go to the moon and I drop this paper, it'll fall very slowly. And if I'm in a place where there is no gravity, it'll fluctuate. So universals are true in certain ecosystems. And the question is, what happens when you talk about human beings? So this orientation will have an effect on the theme selection, on the methods that we use to do research, and on the interpretation that we have of those results. So for example, you have a difference between what we'll call individualistic cultures and collectivistic cultures. Individualistic cultures are cultures where there's an emphasis on the individual and his needs or her needs. Collectivistic cultures are those in which it's more important to have a happy group than a successful individual. This is research that goes on in the US and Mexico. When you look at the research in the US, there's more interest in things like power, leadership, interpersonal influence, and assertiveness. Very little talk about love and abnegation. Abnegation being that other people come before we do. 
And in fact, if you come to Mexico, you'll have a problem. When you want to go to eat, it takes a long time to decide. Because what we'll say is, what, where do you want to go eat? And the other person will say, well, wherever you want to. <laughs> and then they'll say, and what do you want to eat? And we'll say, whatever you want to have. And at what time are we going to leave? Whenever you're ready. <laughs> so making room for the needs of others becomes much more important. And I was listening to somebody tell me that uh, it's very strange when you're trying to get in contact with Latinos and Hispanics because you go to them and you say, we have a program, and they smile and they say yes, and you say, and you want to come, and they smile and they say yes, and then they don't come. <laughs> We're very polite. <laughs> and as going to dinner might take a long time, coming to your program might take a long time if all you want me to say is smile and say yes. When you look at the research done in the US, there's much more interest in personal growth, autonomy. In fact, for many of the clinical areas, independence and autonomy is a sign of maturity. While for many of the Latino and the Hispanics, it's a sign of rebellion because you're not fitting into the group. So there's feel independence, individuality, self-processes, internal control. You're in control of what happens. It's not something that just happened in the, in the environment. And when you go to the Hispanic and Latino cultures, what you'll find is much more research on identity. I am part of a group. It's not about the self. It's about how I fit within a group and mass behavior. So we have a problem in terms of the themes that are researched and the programs that are going to uh, come from that, those themes. There's also a problem with the interpretation of results. We can ask, are these phenomena that we're looking at universal? They fit everybody? Or are these phenomena universal, but there's specific manifestations of these? Or are these phenomena actually distinct to each cultural setting? So the first thing that we need is a definition of culture. So what's culture? Here are several authors that talk about culture, but let me just give you a summary. Basically, culture is any value, any belief, any behavior, any habit that was adaptable for one individual or a group in a specific historic moment, in a specific ecosystem, and that once they came to this ideal, they passed it on to other generations and other groups. So that's culture. Some say that culture is to society like memory is to each individual. So it's kind of the general memory that we have of what we're supposed to do in different moments. And this has a specific impact on what we do. In fact, in 1901, a Mexican the first Mexican social psychologist wrote the following lines. And I, I'll read them to you because I think that they are very important for the programs that we use. Ezequiel Chavez wrote that character varies across ethnic groups. Thus, the most relevant human endeavor is lodged in the study of ethnic character. Not considering this cardinal observation has induced some to fall victims to the absurdity of attempting a direct transplant without even reflecting on the possible incompatibility of intellect, feelings, and will of the people. It is not enough for laws to satisfy intelligence in the abstract. It is indispensable that they concretely adapt to the special conditions of the people they were created for. Ideas and programs may seem very noble. However, the sad reality is lived so often in Latin American countries when marvelous plans are traced on paper, harmonic constitutions are advanced, and like Plato's dreams, they crash against the crudeness of practice and reality. So we have great ideas, universal research, but when we go and we put this into practice, it doesn't work because we're not considering the ethnic character, the characteristics of this group. So we have a little exercise. Now that you've finished eating, I want you to find three faces. And when you find the three faces, I want you to put your hand up. Okay? 
The first thing that you must have noticed is that there's individual differences. Some put your hand really fast, some are still looking. There's a man with a mustache that produces problems because once we see that, we can't see the other ones. Well, what's interesting about this is that in the 1950s and 60s, Witkin did a series of studies and he showed that there's two different ways of perceiving the physical world. He called some of these people field independent. And field independent people take little pieces of information and they break it up into the information that's uh, set inside while others are field dependent. And what they do is they look at something and they look at it as a whole. So if you look at the mustache and the man with the mustache, then the rest of the information is just kind of context. Now, I'm pretty sure that you've already found the th three and that you feel field independent. So let's do the next one. There's 10 faces here. Now you can put your hand up when you find the 10. Individual differences became even wider. Now, what's interesting is that John Barry did some research across different groups. And what he found is that depending on the activity that people make, what they do for a living, they have a different perspective of the physical world. What he found is that when people dedicate themselves to nomadic activities like hunting, they feel independent because it's very important for you to be able to pick out your prey from the bush. If there's a lion in the bush and I don't see him, when I see him, it's too late. Okay? When people dedicate themselves to agriculture, they change and they become field dependent. Because it doesn't matter if a piece of corn isn't useful. What is important is that the whole field is working. And when people become industrialized, they become field independent again. Because it's very important for me to know where that little bolt goes within that large machine. And it has further effects. Cultures that stress field dependence, like agriculture, also have more interest in things like history, literature, poetry, music, and interpersonal relationships. While cultures which are field independent are more interested in physics, technology, math, industry. So one of the things that you can see is, depending on the activities that are done around me and the ecosystem where I grow, I start having a different perspective, not only of maybe the family, but even the physical world that is around me. Universals and specifics that have to do particularly with couple relationships. These circles were used by Levinger in the 1960s to measure how close people felt in a relationship. The top uh, circles are circles that indicate that this two people are not very close. The ones in the middle Im implicate some type of intimate relationship, like a friendship, and the ones in the bottom would indicate a very, very close-knit relationship. Now, in the 1990s, Aaron and Aaron went on to create a theory of this, and they called it the, the theory of including the other in ourselves. And they wanted to know what people thought about these uh, circles. So they asked people, what does it mean when the two circles are almost above one another? And in the United States, people said, well, it means love. And it means intimacy. And it means loss of identity and individuality. So it's good, but not all the time good. We did the same thing in Mexico. And people in Mexico told us, it's intimacy and love and communication and everything good. High levels of interdependence are good. In fact, one of the things that I found consistently in the States when I talked to therapists is that they say that Mexicans have a problem. And the problem is that we're codependent. <laughs> we depend too much on each other. 
And that's a pathology because you're supposed to be independent and autonomous. So one of the things that you start finding is that these ways of looking at the world have an impact on the types of understandings that we have of the world. So it would be important that we look at what are the norms and beliefs and values of each cultural group so that we can tailor our programs and tailor our interventions and in our evaluations and our interventions to these data. There's a series of studies that were done by Diaz Guerrero uh, starting in the 1950s. And one of the things that he said about actually measuring culture is that you can find culture in the beliefs and the norms that people have. So what he did is he basically looked around in the literature, in the music, in popular sayings for statements that more than 90% of the population would agree with. And he called these the social cultural historic premises, the norms and the beliefs of a group. And one of the things that he found and he published in this book that he uh, published in 2003 under the clause of culture is that these are pretty stable. He found in the 1950s, 1970s, and 1990s with junior high school students that they agreed with these statements. Some of these premises have to do with the obedience of children to the parents. Children should obey and respect parents. And he called this affiliative obedience because they should not just obey, they should obey in exchange for love. So children are obedient and in exchange they receive protection and affection. So there's a series of statements that even today in the 2005, we just did another, uh, app, uh, we applied this instrument again. High school, ju junior high school students say that children should always obey their parents. Not sometimes, not when you want, always. Over 90% of junior high school students. What do you think would happen if I went to a school here in kindergarten and asked children, should you always <laughs> obey your parents? might find some differences. Another series of social cultural premises have to do with the relationships of males and females. And there's an expectancy that mothers should sacrifice for family. And fathers have the power, but also the obligation to provide. So you have very, very traditional gender roles. And one of the things that we're going to have to look at when we or working with different groups, is where do they start? What are the cultural norms and values and beliefs that these groups have? Now, Diaz Guerrero also said that these premises have an effect on the type of people that develop in each group. Because what he said is the personality comes from a constant dialectic across life of the sociocultural premises and the biopsychosocial needs of every individual. So we have a rule. The rule is children should obey. So on Sundays we have a meal, a family meal, an extended family meal. And it starts about 11 and we're all gathered. And where's the good child? The good child is sitting right next to us. Quiet. Humble. Docile intelligent because he obeys. And this goes on till two where we have, uh, we all gather and talk and then at two we start eating and then at four we start talking again and then about eight we continue to uh, mingle. And where's the good child? He's sitting right there. And an aunt come in, comes in and we say, you haven't said hello to your aunt. So he gets up and he kisses the aunt and then he comes back and sits down. And then an uncle comes in and he said, you haven't showed him your last trick. So he goes, shows the last trick and he comes and sits down. That's a good child. Now, what happens if the child is hyperkinetic? He's moving all the time because his biological needs are different. So he stands up, and what do we do? We sit him down, and he stands up, and we say, this child's gonna be a rebel. 
So that's the interaction, the dialectic between the culture and the norms and values of that culture and the characteristics of the individual. When you mix these two, you create the personalities of each group. So Diaz Guerrero found this typology of a Mexican. The first group, the affiliative obedient, is about 80% of the population. Affectionate, dependent, pleasing, controlled, and with high need of approval. Now, what happens if you interact and you have certain individual needs, but you also apply some of the culture? You become active internal control. You're affectionate and you're flexible as the culture demands, but you also have some individuality and personal growth. So you might be rational and capable. So this is kind of an androgynous individual, about 5% of the population. Diaz Guerrero said that these are rebels with a cause because they have the best thing of the culture, affection, but also they've brought in a good thing about counterculture, being capable. Another group is the rebel without a cause. The self-affirmative is autonomous, independent, impulsive, dominant, rebellious, and intelligent. He's not looking for the well-being of the rest. He's looking for his own well-being. And finally, the negative side of the culture, another 5%, the external passive control, which is authoritarian, aggressive, corrupt, impulsive, pessimist, uncontrolled, servile. They probably are the leaders of the cartels. <laughs> which is a small percentage of the population, if you look at all the population, but they're very active. They're an active minority. Now, he did these in the 1950s and 60s, and we thought it would be interesting to see what was going on in the Mexican of today. Um, and one of the things that you could do is you could take an instrument that was created in the United States to measure self-concept and then apply it. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that those who created that self-concept measure were thinking in their own culture. So what we did is we went to different groups and we simply asked them, how would you describe yourself? And we had a blackboard and we wrote all the different uh, concepts that they gave us. And then once we had all the blackboard, we could go out and just simply show the blackboard to people and, and ask them, could you identify yourself on this blackboard? But that would be hard for research. And for my arms, I would be tired after a while of carrying this thing around. So we said, we need some categories. So we went back and we asked people for the to look at the information and try to create categories. And what people said is, well, if you have something like amiable and you have something like uh, communicative, that's social. And if you have something like happy or angry, that's emotional. So we found five basic categories, physical characteristics, emotional characteristics, social characteristics, moral characteristics, and instrumental characteristics. And we said, We've advanced science. But then we looked at the dimensions talked about in the United States, and they had the same. They also had social. So what did we find? Well, what we found are the universals, those basic concepts of the self-concept. But what I would say is that maybe the universal is social, but the manifestation is idiosyncratic, specific to every group. So let me take you through an example of what I mean about social in one place and social in the other. I guess you've gone to a party in the United States. You've been invited to a party. You get a card, and the card says, you're invited to the, my party from seven to nine. And then underneath it says, RSVP, tell me if you're gonna come or not. And when you get there, people are there at seven. And they stand around and there's this guy whose name is Bill and everybody's standing around and Bill goes to the first group and gives a good handshake 
maintains good eye contact. And he says, I'm Bill, I'm a carpenter, and I'm really good. And here's my card if you need me. And then he moves on to the next group. And at 9, everybody leaves. And the next day, everybody says, boy, that Bill, he was the soul of the party. Now I'm going to take you to a party in Mexico. <laughs> who comes? Anybody who finds out. <laughs> okay. What time do you get there? Well, if you get there at 9, people will say, why are you here? Are you here to broom the place or clean up? So you have to wait till about 10 or 11 before you get there. Make yourself desirable. <laughs> then you get there at 10 or 11, and everybody is sitting down and singing and telling jokes and dancing. And then about 6 in the morning, <laughs> somebody looks at their watch and says, oh my god, it's 6 in the morning, I have to leave. And everybody turns around and says, what happens is you don't love us anymore. <laughs> so social might be different in one place and in the other. So we went back to the people and we asked them, what does social mean? So we have lists of words and then we did, uh, we applied these questionnaires uh, in different regions in Mexico and this is what we find. First of all, the most important part of the Mexican is a social affiliative part. When we describe ourselves, the most important things are to be cheerful, friendly, sociable, simpatico, I don't know what, how to translate that, amiable and happy. And in fact, once you're happy, you've succeeded in life. You don't have to succeed to be happy. Being happy means you've succeeded. We are romantic, tender, affectionate and loving. We're tranquil and conciliating and simple and obedient and tolerant. So it's a very different perspective of getting ahead of everybody else, competing, being the best. It's interpersonal relationships. The instrumental self, we're tidy and hardworking, punctual, reliable, active, efficient, intelligent, and capable. If you look at these, these are also social. Because if you're tidy and hardworking, that means that you're doing something for the rest of the people. Only intelligent and capable refer to very individual characteristics. The moral self, we should be honest and decent and loyal and respectful, educated, sincere, noble, kind, clean and generous. If this is the moral self, where are human rights. These don't talk about human rights, they talk about collective rights. If I'm loyal and I have a friend who just robbed the bank, I don't tell on him because I'm loyal to the relationship, not to some individual value. So even our morality tends to be collective. And there's also a dark side. And the dark side has to do basically with the emotional side. Somebody who creates conflicts, fails to fulfill, is dominant, bad tempered, fault finder, stubborn, rancorous, and impulsive, which would be the one who tries to impose his emotion on others. Or the other side, the one that lets everybody impose on them. Bitter, apathetic, lonesome, timid, melancholic, nervous, anxious, and sad. So when I'm creating any type of a program, I have to take into account the personality of the individuals that I'm going to work with. And that's one of the questions that we would like to have. So where does culture have an effect on universals, on language, on beliefs, on the way of life, habits, customs, values, norms, family structure? In our particular field, marriage and fatherhood, on family structure. If my family is an extended family where people are supposed to stay, when a child is born in the Mexican or Hispanic family, we open a bank account. So that then when they're 18, we can build a room in the back of the house so that they can come with their spouse and their children to live with us. There's a lot of people coming around, going and, and, and coming. 
In the States, you do the same thing. You open a bank account so that they, when they're 18, they can go far away. <laughs> <laughs> and if possible, not come back. Birth rates. We have large birth rates. So the population is growing much farther. Marriage and divorce. We have a uh, map of divorce in Mexico. And as you go south, divorce rates are 1 to 3%. As you start going up Mexico and getting closer to the US border, it gets closer to 10, 15, 20%. And once you cross the border, there's another story. <laughs> now, why would this be important for the US? Well, simply because there are 45 million Hispanics in the US. One of, out of every six people who live in the US is a Hispanic. So just this implies that it's an important area. What type of models should we have? We can't take simply the universal aspect. We have to think about the interaction between evolution and culture and the production of any type of behavior. And when we start looking at that, look at the effect that traditional norms have on behaviors in the family. When people are more traditional, their children should obey, gender uh, roles are very differentiated, there's a large commitment to the relationship. People stay in the relationship when they're traditional. They have their sexual debut much later. They have sex till they get married. On the other hand, there are certain negative aspects. There's more physical aggression on the part of males, and there's more negative masculinity. Things like being violent, authoritarian, and things like that. So there's some good things, some things that are not so good. The family structure changes, as I told you before. In the United States, Diaz Guerrero and Salai found when they simply told, what does family mean? In the States, they say husband and wife, it's nuclear and it stresses the development of autonomy. For Hispanic, data from Colombia and from Mexico, people say daughters and sons when you talk about family. It's extended and it stresses maintenance of dependent relationships and responsibilities. We are responsible for our children and for our elderly. Throughout our lives, an aunt, a grandfather, a mother-in-law lives with us for long periods of time. Some of the traditional perspectives, mother's abnegation, father's supremacy, affiliative obedience from the part of children, loyalty to the family, strong cohesion, respect for parents, and it's a very special respect, it's a hierarchical respect. Diaz Guerrero and Peck in the 1962 asked people in Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, what does respect mean? In the US it means something that I have for somebody who's equal to me. In Mexico, it means somebody who's higher on the hierarchy. In the States, if you want to talk to God, you pick up the red phone and you call. In Mexico, if you want to talk to God, you look for the child that helps the priest. The priest talks to the bishop. The bishop talks to the pope. The pope talks to an archangel, and he talks to God. So there's a hierarchy, very hierarchical. Family comes before individuals. What effects does this have on the type of relationships that we have? Well, there's a lot of research and programs geared to the content of communication, the listener and talker technique. What we find is that for our populations, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So if you come home and you say, gee whiz, I was instructed on what I can say, Gee whiz, <laughs> food isn't, uh, food is good. That's a problem because I started with gee whiz and she's starting to think, what does he mean by gee whiz? But if I come home and I say, dear, my love, food wasn't too good today. That's okay because the style was friendly. So if I have a negative, Authoritarian style, doesn't matter what I say. If I have a positive style, doesn't matter what I say. 
Positive leads to good relationships. Negative leads to bad relationships. So we have some universals for the group. Familism, extended family, strong ties. Security and order are very important. Taking care of each other, reciprocity. If I do something for you, you're gonna do something for me. I'm not trying to get ahead, I'm just taking something because you're gonna help me. So there's large net, uh, social support networks. Social responsibility, we're responsible for children, for elderly, for the ill. Preservation of public image. If my daughter gets pregnant out of marriage, I'll send her off. She'll be away for a year, and when she comes back, I'll say that the child is actually my wife's. Because it's important that we maintain a certain public image. Field dependence that we talked about before. External locus of control. We think th things happen for some other reason, not because we changed the world. We're not assertive. Several years ago, we started doing some research on assertiveness, and we created a scale, and the first thing that we found is that the first factor is non-assertive. Second far factor, assertive in indirect ways. So instead of telling somebody directly what they should do, we tell somebody else. Could you go tell him <laughs> to lower the music, not to smoke? And finally, assertiveness, but with people that we don't know. We would never be assertive with somebody that we know. And interdependence. Some more aspects of this particular group. Uh, out of data that was, uh, that came out of a fo some focus groups that we did in Texas, when we asked them, what's the most important thing in life? Women said, my children and a good partner that will help me take good care of them. So you can see that the premium is not the relationship, it's somebody that creates a good relationship with children. Well, men said family and economic security. So they're the providers, so they have to think about economic security. Then children, and finally, the mate. Extended family can be the best support for marriage, but also puts a special stress on the relationship when in-laws are too close. So it's good if it's my own family, but it's, if it's her family, then we start to get into some trouble. Now, this impact is happening in the States, but it's coming from the countries of origin. Um, this is data from 350 wives who had migrant uh, husbands and 350 wives who did not have migrant husbands in a semi-rural area in Mexico. And one of the things that we applied is a family functioning uh, inventory that we created that measures and other, other things, family ambience, Things like, we enjoy our time together, cohesion, we are close-knit family. Hostility, we criticize each other easily and expression of rules and feelings. In my family, limits and rules are unclear. Now, we applied this to these two groups, and one of the things that we find, and, uh, and uh, Nelly Salgado de Snyder mentioned before, is that migrant wives have the ambivalent task of being passive and dependent, and at the same time being able to sustain a family away from their primary culture and deal with, their children, with children's independence. So all of these stressors are coming into the relationships. What we find for these groups is that women with non-migrant husbands show a higher positive family ambience and cohesion than those who have migrant husbands. So if my husband is migrating, that's creating problems in the family relationship. And not only less cohesion, also higher hostility among those who have a migrant husband. And remember, the husband goes, the family stays, this starts to create turmoil, and then the husband brings the wife and the children. And this creates another set of changes. So what we're finding is that now we have what we call a culture in transition. The traditional includes obedience of children in exchange for love, protection of women, and family honor. But the ones who are in transition are self-affirming females and children. Children come to the States and they learn English faster. So now we had a hierarchical structure where the father demanded respect in exchange for providing. 
the mother was abnegated and she controlled the love of the relationship and the children were obedient. And all of a sudden, the children are the ones who can speak to the rest of the community. So now they're in power. How do you think the rest of the family feels? So we don't only have to th think about culture, we have to think about change. So this means we have to think about acculturation. And there are several theories that talk about, for example, assimilation. I come to the new country and I simply take off my old hat and put on the new hat and I'm totally different. Or accommodation, I take some of the new and some of the old. Or rejection, I don't want anything to do with this culture. And in fact, there are pockets in Chicago of people who have lived there for 35, 40 years and do not speak any English. Or marginalization, maybe I want to become a U.S citizen with all its characteristics, but the culture will not let me in because they say, no, you're different and you stay different. So do I want to come to the program that the federal government is offering? If they say that I'm different and I'm going to stay there? So there's difference in acculturation. Uh, from data that we have from Hispanics in Texas, from the um, phone call, uh, interviews that were done a couple of years ago, one of the things that we find is that Hispanics only in Texas are very different. Hispanics in Texas who speak English with everybody are the same as Anglo-Saxons in Texas in regards to everything that has to do with family and marriage, parenthood. Hispanics who speak mainly Spanish are very different from Hispanics who speak mainly English. So there's a difference not only from one uh, general group to the other, but also within the group. And there's gender issues. This is some data that we gathered from uh, focus groups in San Diego, and we asked uh, males and females what they thought about being in the States. And males in general said they're not happy with cultural change and feel rejected from the majority culture. They reject majority culture and perceive a lack of respect. Nobody respects them. So now you bring him into the, your program and you say, okay, you're going to learn to take turns talking. Ma'am, what do you want to say? What is he going to say? Nobody respects me out there, nobody respects me here, I'm leaving. Females, on the other hand, and children are empowered and perceive violence and solitude as their main issues. So it's not only one group, it's many groups. And as you can see, the population of Mexico in particular is very large. 11 million of the new migrants, first generation, are from Mexico. And not only are 11 million from there, they have the lowest education level. People who have come from Mexico, 41% of them have less than ninth grade of schooling compared, for example, to those that come from the Caribbean that have 14.6. So they're very, two very different Hispanic groups. And then people who come from Mexico live in, live in large families, three and four, or more than five people. While if you look at people, for example, that come from the Caribbean and Central America, you'll see that they have smaller family sizes. And then, not only does this happen, people who come from Mexico having more children. Their birth rate is close to 11%, while, for example, for the Caribbean, it's only 6.7, and for Central America, 8.5, and South America, 7.1. And finally, we stay married longer, we do not divorce, we have more children, we're less educated. What type of program are you going to create for us? Is it going to be different? Well, it has to be different. Uh, this is something that I read in the paper in San Juan, San Juan de Puerto Rico. And it was large letters, and it said, Guerra de Gangas. And what I understood is that they were having a commercial sales competition. <laughs> because a ganga means it's very cheap. But then I talked to some people in Puerto Rico, and they said, no, it means gangs at war over turf. They took gang, and they went gangas, and then they converted the word. 
So look at what happens from one group to another. This is data that we have from Mexico and Puerto Rico on self-disclosure and how happy people are in relationships. And what we find is that in Mexico, females need to communicate about needs and feelings, and that makes them happy. They're satisfied. While males like to talk about organization and of the relationship. In Puerto Rico, females need to communicate about organization and males want to talk about their needs and feelings. Now, every time I tell my students this, my female students say, Where's, when's the next plane to Puerto Rico? <laughs> but then I tell them, part of the reason that this happens is that in Puerto Rico, there was so much migration of the males that the ratio is about 60% males, females to 40% males. So the reason why the females want to talk about organization is because they have to split up the males. When can you come when you can't come? The males want to talk about their feelings. I'm being used. <laughs> so, in general, what we have is that marital satisfaction for certain groups is going to be related, for example, to positive love styles, being friendly, being altruistic, support and affiliative behaviors, Secure attachment, I'm happy when you're here, not happy when you're not here. Positive negotiation and power styles, we exchange to get to a point. And less anger, less neg negative negotiation, less anxiety and depression. So now we have the knowledge, but this is what can happen. This is the scientist, me and my wife, and she says, you're thinking about numbers all day. You think about mathematics and percentages. Do you know how much this is hindering our relationship? And with precise knowledge, I say, yes, 63%. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to be creating programs and research that is aware of language, education, gender issues, acculturation, and violence. We have to look out to know our communities. If we don't know our communities, our problems won't work. We have to train our staff, especially facilitators, to respond to the characteristics of the group that they're working with. I know that evaluators don't like this, but you have to tell your, tailor your programs to the community needs, not to the researchers' needs. I didn't say that. <laughs> and you have to evaluate the effects in a valid, reliable, and especially culturally sensitive form. And just to end, what should these marriage education programs have when you're talking or working with cis Hispanics? They should be culturally sensitive. That means you have to have knowledge of values, norms, beliefs, customs, and language of the group. You have to be aware of the acculturation processes Gender issues are fundamental. Violence and anger management, communication styles more than communication uh, themes, conflict resolution and negotiation skills, empathy development, family and child services. If you do not have a place where the children can stay, we will not come. Humor, music, and food at the same time, okay? <laughs> If not, <laughs> that's not good. Community network building. One of the things that you'll find when you have Hispanic communities is that they make friends among themselves and then they become support systems within the community. And finally, culturally appropriate assertiveness training for all. Thank you very much.
Thank you, thank you. I want to say thank you so much to Rolando, Dr. Rolando Diaz Loving. It was a great presentation. I believe this PowerPoint is going to be made available to us, and we will make it available to the contractor to make copies or put it somewhere where you all will be able to get it if you want it. So we'll find out more about that and fill you in on it tomorrow morning. Just want to make a quick announcement. If you are part of the cluster meeting for Barbara Spore, she was left out of the program announcement by accident. Barbara Spore will be meeting in Virginia B. So all of the federal, all of your grantee projects that belong to Barbara, please go to Virginia B. That doesn't mean you get a free afternoon off. Sorry. Anyway, lunch is over. Thank you guys. See you uh, tomorrow morning. Take care.